Good morning. It's Christmas already. I feel like it's still August, except that it got cold. It is already Christmas. I feel like the year is flying, right? You too? Just me? Yeah? Thank you so much to everybody who stuck around after service last week to help us decorate. Uh, I really appreciate that because that saved me from having to do it all week and, and Rob and everything. So thank you so much for all of your help last week. I love Christmas. I love Christmas decorations. My favorite part is the lights. I love the lights. I love the white lights. Robert wanted us to do all colored lights in here this year. And I said, no, because it's not your grandma's house. We're doing white lights because it's pretty. I like the white lights that make the room all kind of nice and glowy and everything. I do not like the untangling of lights. I do not like the one light goes out, they all go out. Who came up with that? That was sheer laziness, and I would like to have a word with that guy. Our last Christmas tree that we had was a seven and a half foot artificial tree. And I would put 1,800 to 2,000 lights on that tree every year because I like lights. They're so pretty. You, you know, the, the power strip has six plugs, and then the 100 strand bulbs say you can string three of them. So that's 1,800, and then I would kind of squeeze a few extra. I didn't burn anything down, but it looked really pretty. We had that tree for uh, a little over 20 years, and we finally retired it last year, and I bought a new tree. Now I have a nine-foot tree that has 3,000 LED lights on it. <laughs> I love it. And it goes from box to setup in like five minutes. It's like three pieces, pop, 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 and it's lit, and it's great. You don't have to fluff it. You don't have to find what, you know, what color did that used to be and fit it into the thing and get all scratched up. It's, it's fantastic. It used to take hours to fluff and light our old tree. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all have those trees still? Oh, they're awful. Um, it's a character building exercise, and kids today aren't going to have that, so we're going to have to think of something else. Well, this year, um, frankly, I haven't quite gotten into the Christmas spirit yet. And I'm thinking maybe I'm going to try and get my tree up today, so that might help. But um, honestly, I think I'm not feeling it so much this year because everything just feels so heavy. There's so much division in our country right now. This is the time of the year where we sing Christmas carols with lyrics like, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. But I don't see that playing out so much on social media. Division, anger, hatred, violence, it's everywhere. Everything's extreme. And the fear that's being broadcast 24-7 is oppressive. You can't seem to get away from it. Because there's a screen everywhere you go, right? Like even if you stay off social media and turn off the TV, like your phone pops notifications up, telling you the latest headline and the latest scary thing and the new scary thing and you can't you can't get away from it the negativity is pretty overwhelming and can be downright depressing sometimes i i look around and i think these are really dark times that we live in some of the news i see makes me truly concerned about the future of our country and humanity in general how do we as a country come together again as one nation under God. And then I remind myself what Solomon said, nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. Have you ever wondered why God chose Bethlehem 2,000 years ago for Jesus to come to the earth? This, these are things I ponder. <laughs> why then? Like, wouldn't it seem like spreading the gospel message would be easier today with all of our technology than... 2,000 years ago in a little town that probably had 120 people? Nazareth, where he, where he grew up? Why, why then? Why there? You know, we're at the beginning of the Christmas season, and we all like to focus on the beauty and the joy of Christmas, but I'd kind of like for us to consider, like, the whole story of Christmas for a few minutes, not just the parts that we put on the Christmas cards, because it wasn't all merry and bright. I want to look into the, the world that Jesus stepped into when he stepped out of the glory of heaven. Because it was a pretty dark time then, too. 
Isaiah prophesied about the coming Messiah in chapter 9. I'll read you that in a little while. But he used words like distress and gloom and darkness when he talked about the world that the Messiah would come to. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke are the only ones that record the events surrounding the birth of Jesus. And in fact, there's only about 30-ish verses that tell the story of Jesus' birth. So let's, let's take a look at the world that Mary and, and Joseph were facing at the time. Jesus was born about 500 years after the Babylonian captivity, when Daniel was on the scene and being thrown into lion's dens, and about 400 years after the prophet Malachi. And in that 100-year span there between Daniel and Malachi, God had restored Israel, the temple had been rebuilt. But even in Malachi's time, the people had become complacent in their worship and in their obedience to God. The law required sacrifices, right, to be without blemish. But the priests were lax on that rule, so people started bringing the animals they didn't really want anyway. The one that was lame, the one that couldn't see, the one that was diseased, they would bring those for the sacrifice. That's not really a sacrifice if you want to be rid of it, right? The priests were becoming more and more corrupt. The people were dissolving their covenantial marriages to marry pagan women and follow pagan gods. They were not tithing to God anymore. And the people as a whole were drifting away from God. They didn't see the benefit of serving God when they saw the wicked prosper all around them. So all of that is, is covered in Malachi chapters 1 through 3. But then the last chapter of Malachi, chapter 4, is the last chapter in the last book of the Old Testament. It was the last, Malachi was the last prophet to speak to the Israelites. And Malachi 4.1 says, Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, said the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. The Lord is reminding his people that there's more than the here and now. And there's going to be justice and there's going to be punishment for the wicked, even if they don't see it right now. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked, and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. The son of righteousness is a reference to Jesus, who brings healing and justice. A frolicking, well-fed calves, those are, those are protected and provided for and cared for, just as God cares for us. And then verses 4 through 6, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees of the laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. This reminder of the law of Moses is a call to obedience and faithfulness. And then a promise to send Elijah. Uh, the Israelites, the Jews today still await Elijah, who's supposed to come and proclaim the coming Messiah. John the Baptist was the fulfillment of this promise of Elijah, which might seem like a little bit of a stretch, except Jesus said so explicitly in Matthew eleven fourteen, When he was talking about John, he said, if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. I mean, that's pretty clear. Elijah was the one who was declaring, here's Jesus, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. It's interesting that these last few verses from the last prophet mention Moses and Elijah because they both met God on Mount Sinai and they also both met Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. The last words of the Old Testament are a warning of a curse and then God goes silent for 400 years. There had never been such a length of time without God speaking to his people. So if things were bad in Malachi's time, they got worse in the next 400 years. Complacency breeds complacency. 
During all those years without a prophet, the Israelites' religious life became centered on the rabbinical teachings and on ritual and tradition. The Sadducees controlled the high priesthood who controlled the temple priests. The Pharisees were at odds with the Sadducees because they thought the Sadducees were too liberal and they held themselves up as experts in the law and ultimately they were all spiritually bankrupt. But all the while they were trying, trying to hold on to their positions of authority. That's the state of the spiritual leaders of Israel at the time. So if you, you can imagine what the state of the Israelites might have been. And along with the infighting between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you've got the scribes who, who prayed a lot, but they mimicked a lot of, and parroted a lot of the uh, beliefs of the Pharisees. And then you had the zealots who were advocating the violent overthrow of the, of the Roman government. So the tension and the friction was inescapable. This would have been stuff people talked about at dinner. They were a people with no army and no government of their own, no prophets. So by the time Joseph and Mary meet, Rome had ruled the world for a half century already. The religion of Rome had turned from the Roman gods of mythology to more uh, philosophy and then ultimately to emperor worship. Caesar Augustus had been emperor for about 30 years at this point. He came to power after the assassination of Julius Caesar. Rome allowed small, unthreatening places be ruled by a local, but the larger, more potentially problematic areas were ruled by a Roman governor, like Pilate in Jerusalem. And just a side note, because this is the kind of stuff that I think is really interesting. Jesus would have heard about Julius Caesar and Cleopatra and Mark Anthony and Brutus in his history class. Isn't that kind of cool? That just kind of helps you, <laughs> that helps me figure out exactly where everything fits in, in the history timeline. The Roman rule was really oppressive. Augustus came to power and he kept it by the sword. And there were many Israelites who were restless under the heavy weight of the Roman rule. They'd been, delivery, they'd been delivered from slavery in Egypt. They had uh, escaped the captivity in Babylon only to be prisoners in their own land. So politically, it was a very tumultuous, dark time. Kind of like now. Politically, it's a very tumultuous and dark time. Herod was king when Mary and Joseph were engaged. His dad, Antipater, had been friends with Julius Caesar, who had appointed him procurator of Judea. And then in that same year, Antipater had appointed Herod as the governor of Galilee. Herod and Mark Anthony were best buddies. What do you know? He was a piece of work, that Herod. When he became king, he executed 45 of the 71 members of the Sanhedrin because they didn't support him. <clears throat> Swell guy. On a positive note, he rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Not because he was particularly concerned about temple worship, but... So there's the oppressive rule of a foreign nation. There's a whack job tyrant in charge. There are divisions and factions within the Israelite people, and their worship is perfunctory at best. And amid all the darkness and the hatred and the division and the violence, this is the place and the time in all of history that God sent Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, it says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the, line, the house and line of David. How many times have we heard about that census, right? The Christmas story, we hear about that. We gloss right over it. Oh, yeah, I had to go, just go to Bethlehem. Uh, the Christmas cards all show Joseph leading Mary on a donkey in this beautiful starry night to the warm lighted windows in Bethlehem. It's a beautiful scene. I've, 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 I've sent Christmas cards with that scene myself. Like, it's pretty. But it wasn't, it wasn't a beautiful scene. The census, first of all, was a reminder from Caesar Augustus that I own you. And they knew that taxes would be following the census. And second, Bethlehem is 
at least 75 miles from Nazareth. It was hard to get an Uber. The average person walks about three miles an hour, so that's at least 25 hours of walking at a minimum, but it wasn't flat because there are hills and there's streams and there's difficult terrain. They would have had to walk in the dark some. We don't know that Mary had a donkey to ride on. And that's quite a hardship to endure, especially considering that she was nine months pregnant. And after days of walking, while they had to carry their food and their water and supplies, they go to Bethlehem and there's no room for them. I mean, any of you ladies who have ever been nine months pregnant know what your feet feel like just walking through the grocery store and how your back hurts. And now there's no place, there's no place to, to rest. And while the nativity scenes at Christmas all show Mary and Joseph in this cute stable, probably it, it was a cave, more likely, more likely a cave or a room under a relative's house where the animals were kept. How do you think Mary felt at the end of the journey? The world's in a terrible state. The emperor has required her to make this dreadful trip. She's exhausted. And now it's time for the baby to come, and she doesn't have a place to lay her own head, much less her baby's. And she's just a teenager. And just when everything seems really dark and desperate, Jesus steps out of the glory of heaven and into the darkness of that night in Bethlehem, just as Isaiah had foretold. Isaiah said in chapter 9, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations. By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you. The people rejoice at the harvest as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Through Isaiah, Lord, the Lord was saying that even though things are really dark and hopeless right now, there's a light that's coming. There's a plan for something much bigger and much better on the horizon. God was saying to them, I'm sending you someone. I'm sending a child to be born to you, but it's my son that I'm giving to you. This is what they had hoped for for hundreds of years before Jesus. This was 700 years before Jesus. Their conquering Messiah would come and overthrow the oppressive, the oppressive regime, and that peace would reign forever on David's throne. Someone would throw off the rod of their oppressors. A lot of things had happened in those 700 years. But all the while, the Israelites were waiting for their king. I don't know when Mary might have realized that that 700-year-old prophecy that she surely had heard was about her little baby. Was it that night when he was born, as he's lying there in the manger wrapped in rags to keep him warm? Or maybe a little later that night when this ragtag group of shepherds show up, talking about angels appearing and worshiping the baby she had just nursed? Maybe. I mean, she knew what the angel had told her about her baby being the son of God. But that's an awful lot to wrap your head around, especially when you're cold and hungry and camping with the animals. In Luke chapter 2, 19, it says, Mary treasured all these things up and pondered them in her heart. She needed to mull on that a little bit. 
But none of that, none of the, the, the shepherds worshiping the baby and all that, that didn't change their circumstances. The world was still really hostile and dark and divided. And now they had a baby to care for. The nativity sets are really pretty. I have a couple of them. But we know they're not totally accurate. And by the way, pro tip, don't base your theology on some seasonal decorative figurines. There were wise men who came. Don't really know that they were kings. They were magi, learned men. And they brought frankincense, gold, and myrrh. And somehow we've translated that into be, being three of them. But there were probably a lot more. We don't know. But they didn't arrive until Jesus was probably two. So they weren't in the manger, you know, in the, in the stable with the baby in the manger. They had gone to Herod to see where they could find this king of the Jews that had been born. And as you can imagine, Herod didn't really care for the idea of a rival king. You know that, uh, that Christmas carol, Do You Hear What I Hear? Said the king to the people everywhere. Listen to what I say. Pray for peace, people everywhere. Listen to what I say. A child, a child, sleeping in the night. He will bring us goodness and light. He will bring us goodness and light. That sounds nice. But that's a total fabrication, that song. Because that's not at all what he said. Another tip, don't get your theology from the radio. Jesus brought goodness and light. But that wasn't at all what Herod had said about him. So threatened was Herod by the thought of this infant who uh, might be a usurping king that he sent his soldiers to kill every two-year-old and under baby boy in the town. We don't see that on the Christmas cards. But the Lord warned Joseph in a dream, and they escaped to Egypt until after Herod was dead and it was safe to return. Teenagers going from anonymous faces in the crowd in Bethlehem tasked with raising the Son of God, are now on the run for their lives and living in a foreign land. Can you imagine how overwhelming that must have been for Mary and Joseph? You've heard your whole life about the violent whims of this crazy king, and now he's slaughtering babies because he wants your baby dead? You want to hear something really ironic? Herod is out slaughtering babies, but he's the one that built the temple in Jerusalem, the temple to worship God. Worship the very baby that he's trying to kill. That's the world Jesus was born into, the world he chose out of all time and space. And by entering into that dark, desperate place, he brought light and he brought hope. And his light represents the hope that we have in Jesus. That's what the Christmas season is about. It's not really about a baby. It's not about a manger. It's not about some wise men. It's not about the pretty lights or the catchy tunes or even the presents. It's about the reason that Jesus came. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This hope is the promise of God. That eternal life exists for all who believe. That God loves us with an everlasting love. That God is our very present help in times of need. That God is our refuge and our shelter. That God is our creator, our provider, and our defender. That God calls you his child and forgives you for all of your sins, if you just call on his name. There's nothing new under the sun. And just like it was 2,000 years ago, this world needs hope. This world needs light. We need our Savior. We need Jesus. In Hebrews, it says, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what he promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus had entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. 
God doesn't change, and his promises don't change. God doesn't lie. He is faithful. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Do you know that you don't need an anchor when everything's smooth sailing, right? You need it when the ship starts to rock when the storms come. In fact, the rougher the weather is, the more you're going to need that anchor so you don't lose your progress. I hate all the division I see today. I hate the violence, the ugliness. I hate the fear that I see being peddled on the news and gripping the hearts of so many people. And I think God hates it too. That's why he gave us Jesus. Grab a hold of the anchor. Maybe you're struggling right now because a lot of people are. The season of merry and bright doesn't always seem that way. The state of our world is dark. And if you're only listening to the news and not the good news of the word of God, then you're going to be depressed. Maybe you're dealing with uncertainty because you don't know what's going to happen with your job. Maybe there are tensions between you and your friends or your family because of differences over political opinions and vaccines. Maybe fear has taken hold and started to rule your life. Maybe you're missing someone this Christmas. Maybe your kids are struggling and you don't know how to help them. Maybe you've gotten some bad news from the doctor. Whatever it is, whatever you're facing, there's hope. Jesus loved you enough to come into this broken, dark world to rescue you and to carry you through. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to stumble in the darkness. We have Jesus. We have the light of the world. And with him, we can face the dark places with confidence and with hope. I still don't know why Jesus chose Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, but I think he chose such dark times on purpose because he brought light. He came into a hopeless world to bring hope. He came to a broken and hurting world. He came to the lowly and the outcast to give them love and belonging. Do you know the hope that we have in Jesus? Do you know that Jesus sacrificed himself to pay the debt for your sin? Do you know it? Do you know that there is nothing you can do to earn the love of God because it's already offered to you freely? Isaiah said, do you not know? Have you not heard? And this is 700 years ago. <laughs> do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary, tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Do you know that hope? I hope you do. And if you don't, you can today. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you sent Jesus to be such a light into such a dark world. Our world is broken, and the stain of sin is so dark. But we thank you for the, the sacrifice of Jesus. And because of his sacrifice, we can be made right with you. We can be forgiven, and we can be welcomed into fellowship with you. there's anyone here that doesn't know the hope that we have in Jesus if you're here today and you want to know him raise your hand because I want to pray for you 
Because God is here, and he wants you to know the confidence of the hope that you can have in Jesus. Father, I thank you that you are light in the darkness, that you are comfort and love, that you forgive us, God, that you have provided a way for us. We thank you, Lord. We honor you, and we celebrate you. In Jesus' name, amen.